I get turned on from job interview because of my precept and my beard. Where are we as a people? Do we really respect Rastafari? Don't come talk to Kabaka Pyramid about artists who have locks but they are not Rasta. Before I start talk, a lady just said, Ja! I'm going to say Rastafari I live. With a name that embodies both strength and wisdom, Kabaka Pyramid is not only a musician but a cultural force to be reckoned with. From the Grammys to Canada's Juno Awards, he is recognized internationally for his work. His powerful lyrics, rooted in reggae and infused with elements of hip-hop, tackle pressing social and political issues while inspiring fans to think critically and act consciously. Drawing from his deep spiritual beliefs and rich cultural heritage, Kabaka Pyramid effortlessly blends thought-provoking messages with infectious rhythms captivating audiences around the globe. And today we're absolutely honored and grateful that he could take time out of his busy schedule. Yes, we waited a year and it was worth the wait to journey with none other than International Grammy star Kabaka Pyramid. Welcome Kabaka and thank you for agreeing to take us on your awesome journey. Yeah man, blessing man, blessing. It's, it's been a long way but definitely glad for do this. You know, I've seen a lot of the episodes over the years and it always I look forward to my time to share the journey and thing and you know, we give thanks for all the support over the years from the I and the whole IRFM, you don't know. Absolutely. And we're we're absolutely proud of you, you know, like we're seeing you on the international stage, just wherever you are, like doing it big and you know, that makes our hearts smile. So continue doing it and we're ready. Now, yeah, one of the fun. things one of the things I realized, like just in doing the research, I realized that you have done so many interviews, but you don't necessarily talk about yourself. You're always talking about issues. You're always talking yeah. about the culture. You're always talking about the music. And I think this is why today is going to be so epic because we're here to talk about you. And let's begin yeah. with your foundation. What was it like yeah. for Karen growing up in Kingston, Jamaica? Take us to, to, to those early years. Well, I mean, I always say I had a good upbringing, you know, and you're right. I don't normally get to talk about these things and we give thanks for the opportunity, you know. It's, it's interesting because as an artist, I never really have the typical journey. You know, I think, you know, within the music, you always find, you know, that music comes out of, or the urge to do music comes out of struggle and suffering and these type of things. And. You know, for me, it was, it was a bit unorthodox for me to even venture into music because, you know, I, I grow, you know, my parents, you know, sent me to good school and things like that. I went to, you know, I live University Crescent. I went to Mona Prep, all of these kind of things. And, you know, I had a, had a good childhood, play sports and all of these things. I wasn't really so much into the music like that earlier because... I guess I wasn't as exposed because my mother, my mother now, she, you know, she grew up, you know, she raised us very kind of reserved and Christian. So I never grew up with whole heap of like reggae music I playing on my house and things like that. Mm -hmm. Like Grace Trillers and them kind of thing and pure gospel music, you know what I mean? Like, so, so really and truly, you know, my, my parents, um, they separated when I was about eight. So, you know, I spent a lot of time with my mother and then I would go and stay with my father and thing. You know, me and my, my two brothers then. So my, my, my younger brother was just born at the time, but I had my older brother, you know, Kevin. And um, so sometimes we'd I go stay with moms and then peer gospel music we are listening. And then <laughs> when we go stay with daddy now, that's when... Yeah, hold on. That's when me that get for... Um, that's when me that get for like... You know, listen to the, some of the CDs them and the albums them with him up. So, so it would it would have like a, a a component set with some CDs and then would listen like Bujo Bant and Till Shiloh. Hey. And I remember, I remember him did have Shaggy, uh, Boombastic. So, mm. me always I, I go back and forth between them two albums there. You know, so especially the Bujo, like certain songs we could have recite from start to finish. You know, and thing and um and when when we I got country with my father now, you know, like whether we I go stay at 
you know, hotel or whatever it is, or go river, or go visit family in a country and thing. You know, he would have always have him CD them in the car. I remember him did have a, I think it was a Honda. He did have a Honda, a car, or a Civic one at the time. Them. And him did have like a six CD changer in the car. And him always have pure Bob Marley CD and like all a one Dennis Brown or so. So a pure Bob Marley where I listen when we go country. And him always a brag about how him did go this, this underground record store in England mm-hmm. and buy every Bob Marley album. You know, it's a man where I'm always I tell the same story them over and over. Again. So we hear about that one day. whole heap of time. You know what I mean? So them them thing that was really my my introduction to the music. And then as I said, like I never really grew up, I listen to a whole heap of dance hall and reggae like on the radio or you know, I never go on a big stage show as a little youth or nothing like that. So I really how me would I know about certain songs on the TV? Cause you know he had JBC and CVM mm-hmm. and everything they like. Because there was a period where I never have no cable or nothing like that and thing. And I just, them two channels they were I watched. So I see like, you know, some Shine video and Aini Kamosi. And, you know, I remember Here Comes the Hot Step was one of my favorite song. Them just, just show me I see the video. And, mm-hmm. you know, them time, they, when you see video on TV, it's usually the artists them will get some kind of international signing Exposure. or whatever mm-hmm. and them, them do proper video and it show up on tv you know so i mostly them kind of commercial stuff i would have get to see you know and, and other than that i just pure gospel music you know and then um i guess we can talk about school so me i actually started prep school a year early so i started when i was three normally you start when you're four mm-hmm. so all of my bridging them when we go to school, right throughout from kindergarten, go straight to grade six. I did have a choice to make at grade six, where it was like, I could take my common entrance and, no, no, actually, I wasn't allowed to take the common entrance, I think, because of my age. So I, I could have, like, my father did have a connection to get me into, like, Arden if I wanted to go, mm-hmm. you know. But I decided to repeat grade six and stay back with my rightful age group. So that was kind of, it's recently I look back on my life and I realized that that was kind of like a, a, a you know, like a, a depressing and moment for me in my life. You know, almost. Oh, what? To stay traumatic. back in grade six? Yeah, because all I'm a bridging them when I grow with, like my best friend was in my year, you mm-hmm. know, and, and, and him gone to high school, everybody gone to high school, and then me I stay back with this set of youths where, Younger than me, and but it's like me, it's kind of like the outsider, but at the same time, them respect me kind of because you know, mm-hmm, so it was mm-hmm. this kind of mixed feeling. But the, the benefit of it is, me did all the tests them and all the exam them, so me did know all the answers to everything. So by the time me, you know, when me had the grade six now, me I get peer 95, 98, 100 from the test them, and I'm mm-hmm. a, a pick first choice was champion, and I end up getting for champion and things. So that was one of the benefits them. It's like, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say like I was the brightest youth before that still, but it's like that kind of set me up to, to, to give me this confidence in myself, like mm-hmm. on a level. So by the time I reach champion now, it's like, you know, my daddy and this one, I meet all of my crew, you know, like Abby Never and rocked. Dwayne and Dean and the whole, you know, them time. You know, as a youth, you know, a them kind of introduced me to like dance all and thing in terms of like when we got football training now and the man they must sing all of the hot song them. So me would have know about about what go on the road. Oh you know, wow. And, and, yeah, so me would have know. And then, you know, cause even them time they still like all right, so great so first form now, I moved to College Green in a whole pastures with my mother. And um we did just get cable TV them time. Then. So really and truly, when me at home, me I watch cable and it's like them time I start getting to BT and MTV and, and here comes hip hop. Mm-hmm. You know, this is 96. This is just after Biggie Smalls dead. You know, him dead in a March. Um, I believe 96 the same year. And, you know, July, September was starting school and thing. And I just pure hip hop, me I listen like, P. Diddy and the family and 
Because them mm-hmm. a run off, them a run off BT, you know, and them a run the whole thing them time. But quickly, me start gravitate towards the more deeper rapper them like Wu Tang Clan and and them kind of man, you know, Nas, mm-hmm. you know, and, and 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 it's like my crew at school now. The whole that we usually walk around in a big crew, you know. First, first we did start call ourselves Dirty Glass. Uh, we did love Dutty Cup. Like mm-hmm. uh, we had Sean Paul and Lugaman and Kid Corrupa. That was like with inspiration. It is almost like me never ever really preached at the time, say them was kind of like uptown similar to like me and my bridging them, but we did just love the music. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's like it's like after a while me start to realize the connection. But there was just something about like Sean Paul when we did just connect with, especially as a lyrical artist. You know, and because me I get into hip hop now, it's like me I start study lyrics. And even mm. from before, even from before me was a man, come I tell you, like when me I listen to Till Shiloh album, you used to study all of the lyrics. I'm a living while I'm living to the Father, I will pray. Only him know how we, I'm a can sing the whole song. You know, so me did always want to learn and study lyrics. So between the hip hop and then dance all now, like Baby Sham, Bounty Killer. You know, them man they were pre. Remember Spraga Benz was, mm-hmm. a, was a big influence on me early because of him lyrics. You know, and then me did always I watch out to see when the man them collab with the with the hip hop artists, them like change just like the way that you know, Bounty mm-hmm. and, and Busta Rhymes and when them do the song them with Coca Brothers and um, you know, Fuji's and them kind of thing. Uh, Eve Art. Even before me start first one, me did visit my family in a, in a England with my mother, my brother them, and Fuji's, that some of them, them are run off the whole of England. Like every radio station, you yeah, hear Fuji's just a play right throughout the day. So I become a big fan of them too, and then, you know, Bounty Killer collaboration with them so that they mean even more to it. You but know, but Kabaka, with, with you finding um yourself um you know as a youngster and realizing your love for the music from taking your tricks to country with your dad and yeah. listening to the music, did your mom at any point in time you know like picked up on this newfound love for music and your passion for yeah. hip hop and what was that conversation like? So, mom was always like. What kind of boogie you got to say I played at the house? <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. that, that was always the vibe, you know? So, like, when mommy dear, you know, we have to turn the TV down low because, you know, certain things. And then when we start to buy albums you now, them time we can't make mommy hear because the bad word them. You know, so we can't make her hear certain things. Because I remember, I remember I bought P. D. and the family album. Um, I went to New Jersey in 98 and I bought a DJ Clue album. And a sway and tech and DJ revolution. And the only reason why I bought these albums mm-hmm. is because Cannabis had songs on them. And that was like my favorite rapper at the time. So Cannabis, big pun, you know, um, I don't maybe Eminem just did start come out. And these are all like top level lyricists. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So between that now and and when we start listening, like start listening to radio or sat there and start record. You know, when, when radio play, you know, others, I don't know if we can call up other stations because we're at Irish. But you know, I listen to Irish, I listen to a couple other things at the time. Mm-hmm. And it's like, me usually record when the dancer come on, oh, hear the dancer juggling rhythm, them like street sweep and broke out and, and um, playground rhythm. You know, like them, them rhythm that, but just like where I listen to radio, just fear them thing there. And wow. when we start go out, Probably like in third form, we start go party and everything. And it's like, we can't leave the party unless we hear a certain song. You know what I mean? And, and that was the vibe. So mom art. But early out, I remember mom, so mom didn't want me to join the choir. Because moms love singing. Now, you know, mom's probably listening, but <laughs> moms is not the best singer. You understand? But moms <laughs> love singing. <laughs> You know, I she does love it. And she, <laughs> and she sing with passion. That's that's what I love about her too. But it's like me you now, me kind of did have my struggles with just singing. Like I was never, mm-hmm. I always tell people, I never born with any kind of singing talent. Like, but they joined the choir and I did mostly two 
two sessions. I wouldn't forget what them choir practice. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, nah, this is not me. This is not me. <laughs> you know, but I so, kind of regret it to this day because if I did do it, I'd have better off as yeah. an artist. But, and the but same when, thing with piano lesson. Like, I did do mostly two or three piano lesson, and I just stop. Like, I never have no discipline in them time. Then. You know, but, them time, I just, I just want to play game, video game, and I just want to play sports. And you know, they're they playing a piano and a singing on a choir and them kind of things. So here it is, Kabaka, at a young age, you understood that, you know, singing wasn't your thing, but you also have this love for the music, a passion um, as a yeah. young lyricist, like, you know, you identified with that. At what point on your journey was that seed planted in your heart that, you know, you can actually be a star, you wanted to be an artist? When did, when, when did that realization um, come to you? So, so I... Right. I was always one of the man them where I get the most joke in a class. Like, we did always want that attention and, 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 you know, but not really like pan of ego thing. It's like, me did just want to make people happy and make people laugh a certain way. Mm -hmm. So, me, me, me remember me, me do things in front of the whole like, assembly and just a run joke and thing. When them think me, I got to say something serious, me just say some foolishness and the whole, the whole school start laugh and them. That was me, you know. So me did always kind of have this thing like I want to be a star, I want to be the center of attention a certain way, you know. And and when when we start getting into the music now, I really started from the sound system, but it started a sound called Time Bomb. Now, after, the, the, the name Dirty Glass never lasts too long. They end up <laughs> changing the name to, to Bomb Squad, you know. And, and I don't remember where the name come from. I probably mean they just make it up. But it's like that became our thing. And then Time Bomb was the sound. So I had Bomb Squad, the crew, and Time Bomb was the sound. So, you know, me and Dean and, and, and Abby and, you know, the whole other way, we just, we usually like, I. Right. So me did into, my father was a, a businessman. He, he had one of the first, if not the first, computer store in Jamaica. Um, around Hagley Park Road. So I grew up around computers. Like in the summer, me used to, work for my father and like fix computer and build computers from scratch and anything. So we always had computer at home. So when we start learning about certain software and thing like, you know, Cool Edit and Acid Pro and all of them thing, me just quickly figure out how to put the, the dance hall a cappella them over the hip hop beats. So we mm -hmm. usually see like, you know, Renaissance and Code Red and Black China them and all of these sounds doing this remix thing. You know, so we kind of follow and take inspiration off of them. Copper shot and these sounds, you know, uptown. So when we have a party and Sweet 16 and them thing, and them sound the way I see and the remixing was this big thing. So, you know, me kind of figure out how to do the remix them quick. So we start with some mix CDs and I hand them out in a school and, and then we start, you know, put the sound together and buy a record and all and cut dub plate and them things. So this was like, Fourth, fifth on. You mm -hmm. know, so we really start do the sound thing. I will start keep certain party and them kind of thing. And, you know, and, and, and that was the whole thing. So we really, it's really the sound system thing when we get into the music. But we did have a bridge in now named Odin where in my class. And the two away, they just read Big Pun and Cannabis. So we eventually we start like, writing out lyrics and a clash with each other in a class and them thing like me would have write out some mm -hmm. lines and him would have write out some lines and so it kind of start from penning penning out like me not even really figure out some want like verbalize or anything we just uh, write out the lyrics to them so it was really always uh like a mental thing for me like me's a very cerebral person so when it comes to lyrics and them kind of thing, it start all like that. Then we start for kind of back and forth, freestyling and them things. Because, you know, in a, in a class, you always have the man them can beat the rhythm and decks and we mm -hmm. always sing, we dance or song them and them things. So that was part of the upbringing too. But when it comes to like just what me was passionate about, it was kind of hip-hop because, you know, like it just... I guess the fact that I never really have to worry about melodies and, and yeah, sing on a particular pitch or them thing that me, me couldn't really do. So hip hop just became an easy expression for me. It was just like talking with a pattern and, and, and mm -hmm. rhyme scheme. So 
the, the whole thing for me was about just being technical with how many syllables you get for rhyme and all that. Sometimes it never ever matter what me I talk about. It's just how technical is the rhyme scheme. That's all that mm-hmm. matter to me. You know, and, and it's the, the rapper them when me, like when you listen to Wu-Tang Clan and some of them, man, you don't even know what the man them are talking about. The man them just has say some abstract thing, but it just sounds so wicked. You know, mm-hmm. so that was kind of, that was kind of my schooling. And then I actually, so me in a fifth farm, we usually get in a peer trouble and thing. Them time we start getting a whole heap of fight and thing and you know, not no gun thing or no knife thing or mm-hmm, whatever, mm-hmm. but you don't know. We just fist fight and them thing and we have a party and I get in a fight and then one at a time I end up beat up this, uh, me in a fifth farm, I'm beat up this lower six farm youth right by the staff room. You know, mm-hmm. so all the teachers, they watch a fight and thing and then, them, you know, some upper six youth, they end up a part of the fight and thing and them end up get suspended. So no, not two days of, yeah. <laughs> but the two but the two days of like going to school and have to do like janitor work at school to serve for the suspension and punishment. Wow. Mm-hmm. Because of them things there and like, you know, other things were going on. I remember one time where I played ball, I mean it, you know, I play course in a fifth farm. That was the first time I actually did discipline enough to continue training and say me I met the team. Cause as I said, I never disciplined. Me from first farm, me usually Go look at football training and then stop. If I feel like I nah, get no game, I just get discouraged and stop. But fifth farm, no, I actually met the team and thing. But, you know, I dep on the bench and remember, I youth, we dep some country school there or Spanish town or one of them places. there. And I youth must try to rough up Abbey one time on the field. And I remember me rushed on on the field and like, ready for rush the youth there and they end up holding me back and things. So I never actually get to him, you know, but Mm-hmm. Just the fact that them see me do that, when we reach back, when we reach back school the day, them take away my jersey and tell me oh, wow. suspended from the team and all kind of thing stuff. You know, I feel like some of them little thing there is why them never accept me into sixth form a champion. So when I it's actually in summer after my football training, come out my train for for morning cup them time in, and them you know me I, where I play practice match and I start knowing and I say yeah. Six farm, man in cup, re, re, re. And after training one day, the dean of discipline and the coach just, them asked me to stay back after training. And them just, them tell me, say, you know, me now go, them now accept me in a six farm and thing. Wow. So I remember my walk home that day, them, you know, me I walk and I just start ball like me. I said, Jano, you know, me now go go six farm and all of my bridging them. Because my grades them was good, but, but you know, we get a couple of one, couple of twos and thing in a CXC. It's like six subject men up with. You know, like English literature, I never <laughs> from reach I can't fail I feel literature. Like, but never read no. Read that is ironic. Yo, I never love reading at all. Like, trust so, me. So at, me at what point? Like, at none what of point? the literature book them will get. We, we never finish not one of them. <laughs> so what we are gonna get to when we start reading and them things. Right, because um, that, that was my that was my next question. Because your your journey is so <laughs> rich that we it cannot be told in an hour. One hour cannot <laughs> suffice any at all. So, I'm so start in, fast forward. Yeah, just in the interest of time, no. So here it is and we're really happy for that story because right now you are, you know, a model entertainer for you know a lot of persons and here it is hearing just the gritty details of your story get trouble getting a fight and like a lot of a lot of youths can relate to at what point um kabaka did you you know there was a turning point was it when you found rastafari and how 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 did that happen so that's how i get to right now i mean i try to keep it fast try to speed it up you know so when we never get Accept into six farm. My mother migrated in 2000. This was this was summer of 2001. So we end up getting to judges, and I did like one semester at judges, and then you know. But that summer now, I went to start for born herb. So hey. at them time, they know it's like a peer herb thing, and like parents them are find out and then vex and you know my father, you know I check when any time reach home and them kind of things. So. You know, that was the whole vibe. All our bridging him, you know, we just 
bun beer herb and things. So my mother never liked that. So she said to get me away from all of that now. Me, you know, bring me up to Florida with her. So them time I migrated January 2002. And I just did there with my mother. I couldn't get into I couldn't get into no school at the time because the year already started. So I just did there now, they are foreign, you know, banana herb. I just <laughs> in our one complex, I go to the gym every day, I lift beer weights and things. So when I reach, I end up start college because I couldn't continue high school because I already did CXC. So I start college. In March, and then I end up taking a break for the summer. I go back to Jamaica now, link up back with all of my bridging. And then that summer now, where I drive around and I go party and all of them things. Remember, one of my bridging and older brother I drive around and I want to deport him. And Abby did have this cassette with like maybe about 14 Sizzler songs on it and like five Buju songs on the two sides of the cassette. And where I listened to the CD there for the whole summer. That um, cassette, I listened to that cassette for the whole summer, and it come in like the music just the music just took me over. I'm not telling a lie. Like, it's like a spiritual experience when I listen to them, them sizzler, they're like crazy John, homeless and holding firm and um, you know, love is divine and and yo, trust me, them song they just it really and them time they're on a barbican terrace and you know, we did there with the youth, them round there, so I burn up beer chalice and I end up a, a reason with a, a Ras who was Sizzler best friend at Dunoon, or at least that him tell me. And the man started telling me beer story about Sizzler, and it's like, it come in like, I just start worship the man because it's mm. thrown away though. <laughs> but it's like, it's like the man had talked about Sizzler in like this, this mythical way. Mm -hmm. You know, and just a talk about how the man educated and about how the man take the thing serious and just militant and and then me I listen to the man them songs and to me I, I never hear no music where I'm not influenced over me like them sizzler. Them. You know, so when we reach after that summer then now reach back a foreign and thing and you know, cause them I me you me grow up I eat pork and beef and chicken, fish, everything. Mm -hmm. But you see, by October, I cut out everything in a one week. So that summer when I started wow. listening to the sizzler, them, they cut out pork. I stop eating pork. But when I reach back now in a one week from beef to fish to everything, I just cut out in a one week. And I just never look back. You know, till this day, I still eat all from them time there. And I start twist up my hair and all of them something there. And I just I listen. Remember, all right, them time you now, you have like beer share and them downloading platform. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to start mm -hmm. search for every Sizzler song I can find. <laughs> I made it about a thousand Sizzler songs in my Winam playlist. I'm just a listen to Sizzler morning, noon, and night. Wow. And I'm going to just start twist up my ear. Then I start <laughs> reading about His Majesty. Then I, 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 get, I get a book called Negus and then I read about that and the, 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 the legacy of the kings in Ethiopia and then I read the Kebra Negus. I'm just do beer research about Ethiopia and his majesty and the Bible. I start reading about my Bible. When we listen to your, your songs, you know, from Mystic Man to Choppings, you know, featuring yeah. Massacre, understanding your foundation and what you just told us, that basically explains why, you know, the music that you do, we hear the influences of hip hop and here it is, the reggae influence from listening to, 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 to Sizzla Kalanji. So let us fast forward now to your first song. Do you remember your first recording that gave you recognition among the Jamaican people and what was that feeling like for you? Yeah, so... So the, the first project I released that kind of put me on the map was Rebel Music. But I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say any of those songs. Maybe Warrior with Protégé was a song that kind of people knew. Like mm -hmm. it's always a song when I touch the stage, I'm a sing it, my sister people know it. But it's not like a song where they play on radio or anything like that. But like, <clears throat> um, I think No <laughs> Capitalist was the first one on the Tropical Escape Rhythm. But kind of people start to hear, you know, Kabaka, you know, on radio and certain things. And it wasn't necessarily one of the biggest songs for the juggling still. But, you know, because of that, I start to get some exposure. And then, you know, like, start to voice for Frost, never going to be a slave. 
you know, mm-hmm. all of them kind of songs that kind of start get like a rotation. I start hearing myself on the radio a little more regular. But I would say me all right with, with Chronics and the Rising Sun Rhythm was the first song I could say was like a hit song in Jamaica. You know, even though you don't know, enough people have it as a chronic song. But you don't know, like me have two verse on it and and or three, whatever, two and a half. And it's like definitely that was a song where you know, if police stop me and them say, who, you know, who you is? I'm going to say, I'm here Kabaka prayer. Which song you sing? We can sing that one there. Yeah. And them know, <laughs> and them deal with me different. You know what I mean? So that was a song, the first one, where we could have said, like, the average Jamaican know that and thing. And, and then I, I would have said, well done, no, was the, the, the one where really, you know, made me kind of like more of a household name, I would say. You know, mm-hmm. 20, 2050 in them time, they know, well done. That's the first, like, solo song where I get, you know, proper rotation and, like, the average Jamaican would have, would have know that song then, whether them call it. Some people say, yeah, man, are you sing the song there about congratulations? <laughs> 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 you know, like, or, or Mr. Politician, man, you know? And and them thing that's so, yeah, them, them time, they know, Things start to really pick up certain way, and that was the, actually the first song working with Gang. So I remember um, a mutual friend sent me, sent me a rhythm, and said Gang, you know, want me to voice and it is a juggling. Cause that rhythm was actually on Wayne Marshall album, where where Gang did produce, mm-hmm. and um, you know that's when me write the song. I remember I was over doing it, doing it, people in the yard, and we there watch a Champions League game, and after the match, don't know. But just write out the whole lyrics from start to finish. I mean, I normally do that. Normally, it's either them time and we just start to kind of vibe songs in studio where I'm not even penciling down much, but we just have sing what come to me and thing. But them time, I write out the whole lyrics from start to finish and, you know, and then I send it to Gang and Gang love it. And I mean, I fly up to Miami and dead a while him and him engineer and mix it off and thing. And, that's when him start to show, say, yo, he would have loved to work with me more and him been observing what I go on and him want to do a couple of albums, you know, wow. at least one and thing. And it's from them time, the early 2015, that's that's when the link really start. You know, that's that's almost nine years ago now. You know? I so, know. Wow. And, you know, would, would you say like even that connection with with Damian Marley has helped you to evolve as an artist as well? 100%. 100%. Uh, gang, gang is a man where I go tell it like it is. You know, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. Mm-hmm. If, if him feel like my need for improve in any area, I'm going to tell me. And, you know, certain things with melody and certain things with my voice and like timing and these things, I'm always uh, emphasize. And, that's the thing, like a lot of artists in the business, them, them grow up having mentors or people to guide them certain way. But when me started, it was just me and my bridging them from school days, you know, mm-hmm. and we, all we had was each other, you know, and, and a lot of my, this, the craft that I was, you know, building for myself, a lot of it was around hip hop because I actually felt more comfortable rapping at first. So I kind of spent years honing my craft as a rapper while still working on my, my sing J DJ style, you know. But mm-hmm. less time was put into that. So it's really over the years now I felt comfortable now to kind of step out as a reggae artist. Because I, I have hip-hop mixtapes and them things that where I did drop and did a promote and like I touch the street mm-hmm. and I print CDs and all of them things. So like I could have been a rapper easily. You know, mm-hmm. but you don't know. Reggae music are still the heartbeat and the foundation and the source. And as a Rasta youth, I always felt like the messages I want to bring across, you know, reggae is a platform for that. So I did no. always kind of want to be like a sizzler. Or like, you know, even Damian Marley himself was a big influence too. You know, I remember Still Searching was like one of the big tunes then for we as youth. You know, and then, you know, obviously we we'll watch everything with it was written and them them big song there and then jam rock and so so gang kind of became the blueprint of you know how I want to see myself as an artist. Mm-hmm. You know, and then and then obviously Stephen Marley with the sound and everything and him kind of him kind of represent the sonics of what I love, like blending the hip hop production with the reggae, you know, with still that rooticalness in it. You know, and, and yeah, these are some of the pillars like Capleton. Now, I watch how Capleton perform. 
same with Anthony B. Like, I go up on tour with Anthony B. I'm going to see, you know, I do some shows with him. I'm going to study him craft. I'm going to see how him handle the crowd and all of them things. So I kind of get the performance influence from Cape and Anthony B. And like, you know, Bojo is a big influence too, just, just overall, just as an artist and using your voice and your style and your pattern and all of them things. So, you know, we, we take a little bit from all of these artists. And it, it's very important what you said, because here it is, you understood in the moment that you don't know everything. You understood also your limitations. How important is it, Kabaka, especially for entertainers who are listening now and their egos are so big and, you know, they, they can't hear anything. How pivotal is it to, to, to listen and have these mentors and, and, and take constructive criticisms in order to be great? For me, it's pivotal. It's, it's, it's crucial. You know what I mean? Like, I, I think sometimes I go to the other extreme where I can't even be too hard on myself or, like, too mm -hmm. critical. Because enough people, them, them see it and them them pre like it's almost like a lack of confidence, but it's not really that. It's just may I observe everything, every detail, you know, I'm a know some more improve. So for me to point it out, that's a that's a quick way for you to, to address it and to work on it, you know. But you definitely have some people who don't already yet, but them have all the confidence in the world. And then now you have people where are them confidence is what make their music sell and make people love them, even if they're not technically as gifted. But them confident in themselves. So that's why we said, you know, the song Believe. You have to be confident in yourself. But to me, you know, having guidance and having mentors and actually listening is a, is a critical element for sure. I wanted to talk about your Grammy win. Now, after you won, you toured extensively to the point where RTS could not get you for a sit down because <laughs> you were literally um, on the road. The highs, the lows, the challenges, and the memorable moments. Describe for us, you know, what this experience was like for you. Yeah, the Grammy thing now. Yeah, life changing. You know, I remember from the nomination, I was I was very surprised. I'm not gonna lie, like, you know, but just grateful, like totally grateful because. So it's one of them things that we're from we do the album. You have a good set of people where I tell you, yo, this this a Grammy album. This it have the it have the Grammy thing about it. You know, but me as a man, me not let them thing they get to my head, sir. Mm -hmm. You know, so you know, we're always humble to the thing and always Yeah, me, me, me kind of find where sometimes when when me have less expectation, that's when me see. Results. So I'm not, you know, I'm not try to go out more things and get too ahead of myself. So that was my kind of approach to the whole thing. But when we got the nomination, I was like, wow, you know what I mean? And you see the, the class of artists when I'm nominated. Mm -hmm. with. So that was our next thing now where I remember, I don't know if it was it was IRFM or some platform did a poll to see who are going to win or a thing like that. And I watch who the people and I vote for and think. I'm going to say, all right, cool, and that's a go on. Because I think mine was like the, the lowest, you know, in mm -hmm. terms of that. So I'm going to say, all right, cool, you know. But you don't know. A lot of people, a lot of people vote for these things and them don't actually listen to music. So my thing was always, if you listen to my album, you have to vote for my album. That is how Thanks. I felt about that mm -hmm. set of albums that year. You know what I mean? And it's like, for me... You know, may I say to myself, why if me do win, more proto win? Because, you know, it's like me know say him is a man where him, him I work hard over the years and him helped me out a lot to start my reggae career. You know what I mean? So that was my mess going in. But when my daddy and the day now, <clears throat> you know, my daddy and me I say, boy, I'm not even I think about whether or not me I go win. Because daddy are full joy, you know, you're there at the Grammys. No, without the pre-ceremony. So it's basically, it's not the, the pre-telecast ceremony. So it's not the televised one. It's a different room. It's a different side of Staples Arena. But it's still a massive space. Like when you reach in, it's still, it's like mm -hmm. this is still like the most sophisticated thing I ever got to. You know what I mean? In terms of an award. And you look and the part, big up your What's stylist. That? I'm saying you yeah, look yeah, the big part, big up your stylist. Yeah, you know, we have to step out accurate, you know. 
So yeah, that was a vibe. I'm a dead with mums, mums forward, Abby Dwayne, Rani, um, Paul, Natalia, Dwayne, Pops, Uncle Dulu. I believe that was the whole team that forward. And we did know where, you know, where I sit and watch the thing and I say, holy for people. So like jazz musicians, rock and roll, classical musicians, all of these categories are being, you know, announced and people doing them acceptance speeches and it's literally not until about maybe one hour before. Because we did it for about maybe three hours before them called reggae. Mm -hmm. And it's like within the, the hour, it's like me start thinking, I'm saying, what am I actually win? <laughs> that means <it's> like, <laughs> literally at that time, I start saying, I had no speech plan, nothing like that. Wow. So it's, it's them time that now I start for me. It's like, what am I going to say? Like, because I, I'm seeing people win and it's like, is that really triggering my mind so it could actually happen? You know, and then when them say reggae and them, them you know, them call out the nominees again and them, then them say, uh, did they call my name first? Uh, I think they, they said the call in first. Mm -hmm. And then they say Kabaka Pyramid. And it's like, just this overwhelming feeling just take over my wow. body. And it's like, it's like my, my, my head just going on my hand and I'm just like, it's like I just fall on to my lap. I'm just dead for like about 10, 15 seconds and my mother jump up and I dance and <laughs> run and scream and everybody I shout and yo, yo, <laughs> you know, pure excitement. And it's like, I don't know, I just, it was a sombering moment, but at the same time, it's like, you feel like, I don't know, I never feel anything like that before. And I'm going to get up and start walk, and then like, my hair start pull out, and I'm just, <laughs> I'm just let flash it out, and I'm just dead and like, tears I fall from my eyes as I walk up there, and I kind of compose myself. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm a dead and and a lady like as before me start talk a lady just said ja i'm gonna say rastafari i live you know and, <laughs> and, then, and then, <laughs> like, i even met that lady after i think i was at reggae on the river last year sierra nevada one of them festival and and she introduced herself to me as like a media person and um i hear me just you know Big up who may big up um big up Taiwo or Bridgin where 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 was murdered actually by a rapper where in our link and wow. big up Joe Mercer and just you know gang and everybody and um, you know mommy there there with me everybody there there with me and it was just yeah man it was a life changing thing from there you know the whole thing just shift up the whole trajectory of my career just shift up you know and it's like. People who did see Kabaka and respect Kabaka, but it's like them never give me that kind of ratings. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, you're them around people or you walk in a room and it's like, it's like a different impact when you walk in a room now. You know, and you see how some of your favorite artists them and them see you and it's like, it's like a different glow in them eye when them see you a certain way, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it's like, I say, all right, yeah, you know. Is, is really a, is really a validation where people feel, you know. For me, I'm still the same person. I'm still the same artist. But you can see, you can see the impact it have on everybody around you, you know. And you know, big up to my team and and you know, everybody for still remaining who we are and humble and thing. You know what I mean? And that that has always been our thing: respectful, and, and professional. You know? I, I really appreciate that story that you just told us because I think in essence, it basically confirms, um, you know, that the Grammy carries weight. 100%. 100%. Mm -hmm. No, you're going to have the naysayers, you know, you're know? going to have the naysayers and the people that say, oh, it's because of gang and the Marley's and re, re, re and all of that. But, you know, aside from them kind of thing, like for sure, the Grammy... Definitely. It, it, it put you in a different category in people's mind and within the industry, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're getting booking. We went to Reunion Island, went to Morocco, we went to Brazil. All of that was last year, you know, places we've never been before. You know, the, the negotiations step up, the, the figures where you're getting for shows, all of these things. You know, it's, it's similar to getting like a big hit song or billboard. It's like it changed. Mm -hmm. 
It changed how people view you. It changed your negotiation, all of these things. It's definitely something to, to target. And for me, it was we got the, the overwhelming sense from everybody that, you know, this was a win for everybody. It's like, it's like a win for the, the underdog certain way, a win for the people mm -hmm. who go through the struggle and go through because my, you know, Kabaka is never the one we get the full highlight from everybody or whatever. But it's like we are we're always put in the work consistently. And we always are trying to do the right thing and represent the music the right way. So it's like when people happy for we, them happy for we in a different kind of sense than mm -hmm. even, you know, other artists. That's the vibe I got. It's like it's just it just means so much to people and and it's something where we, you know, I've only for pride about for sure. No, absolutely. But but you know, like you said, the calling, I've listened to it multiple times and it 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 it's one of those albums that I, I play in my house, you know, on a Sunday yeah. and you vibe or you do your work and you you know, you do your chefings in the kitchen and them thing there. So I know it's a masterpiece, but does this success for you, Kabaka, you know, kind of pressure you when you think about your next <laughs> album and what's that like? Yeah, for sure. There's a little bit of pressure. It's, it's, it's a race and the standard. So, you know, certain things where I could have fly before, you know, we know so the next album, you know, it have to connect, it have to be on that standard. Like, not necessarily say we have to win another Grammy, you know, but it's just, the thing elevated now. It's not like, you know, Kabaka is a, a, good, a good artist and, you know, he might try a thing a certain way. No, it's like, we have to set a standard now for the music, you know, mm -hmm. and, and for, the, for the, the, the works, the album, the live show, the presentation. You know, last year, I shift up the whole way, I structure my live show and step it up on a different level. And, and when people see it, then they must say, OK, we see the difference now and we see the growth and, and all of that. So definitely there is a, there's a, there's a pressure, but it's a good pressure. It's mm -hmm. not the depressing type of pressure, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like it's a motivation. And you mentioned um, Joe Mercer in your in your Grammy acceptance speech, and you just highlighted that a short while ago you were also in Nine Mile recently. Um, you know, yeah. for his tribute concert, you had you you have a collaboration made it. Um, what was that? Describe for us what what that whole vibe was like, just being there. I'm sure it was you know somewhat bittersweet. Yeah. Yeah, but to be honest, it was mm -hmm. it was one of the most special nights I've experienced in a while. I can tell you that. Like, just everybody who was there, you know, the, from in rehearsal, you know, when we did there and we just a vibe. There was a spirit in rehearsal, and then Lauren Hill passed through rehearsal. You know, she did it with YG, and it was just, and she just did it, just humble. Like, I remember my kind of, you know. And I hitch up myself beside her a little bit and, you know, I say, oh, more, I get this, I like one talk with, you know, and just, and it's like, yeah. you know, so welcoming and, and thing and, you know, but it's like, we're fanning out at the same time, you know, but it's like, there's a respect because, mm -hmm. you know, she's familiar with me and know me and certain things. So it's like just experiencing that and then, you know, you know, when, when, when gang fly in and everybody did they know and with their museum and, and then with their nine mile now and the whole, but it was, it was like, it was like one week of just a, a, a different kind of energy. May I tell you that for sure. You know, we did there with YG, them and the young you, them, you and them at Trench Town. And then, you know, we did a Joshi, a forward and, mm -hmm, I saw you know, that. he's a different youth. You know what I mean? And we had touch road with the youth, them and, you know, Mystic and her sister, them and, and everybody and, we, you know. Is is like it's a real family vibes. I'm a love to see how the next generation of youths are take up the mantle now. And that's our next special thing to see. You know what I mean? So so seeing Johan kind of host the first segment of the show and you know Jesse Dede and, and Proto Forward and everybody, it was just a it was a vibe. And then for see, when we see Zilla, Steve. Sizzle and Caperton on the stage, same time. I'm mean, just mm -hmm. watch them right side Epic. of the stage. Just, it's a different energy. It's a different energy. These are like four pillars of my influence, just sharing mm -hmm. a vibe together on stage. And 
We can just imagine how it was for the average fan. You know what I mean? It was, it was special, truly special. Um, what would you say is your takeaway from just, you know, being around the Marlies? Because you're not only, yes, you're doing a lot of work with Gong, but, you know, you, you interact yeah. with Steven. And I remember the last time I saw Joe Mercer Marley was at Best of the Best in Miami. And you were there, you know, on stage, almost yeah. like a crutch for him. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like I kind of observe and saw that whole vibe. Yeah. But what, what is the takeaway um, for you, Kabaka? Just being around yeah. them and, you know. I mean, for me, it's just all about the importance of legacy. You mm -hmm. know, and, and I see how, how they take the legacy of their father, Bob Marley, so seriously. Rita Marley, you know. And, and yeah, the family is almost like a dynasty, you know. And, and you're watching it. Cause right now, I watch whole heap of shows about you know, monarchic dynasties and thing. And it's like, when we really think about the Marley family, it's really like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And different ones kind of have their their domains and their kingdoms and different sects. So, so me, you don't know, I, I, Zilla, am I a general, you know what I mean? And, and, and Steve by extension, certain way. And it's like, you know, just watching that and seeing, just observing how, how they interact and how they embrace each other and, and not only that, but like seeing the Mali brothers going on the road in the U.S. Because I feel like the U.S. is a really critical market for touring where, you know, if, if we really target the, the U.S. right, you know, it can be, it can be a, a springboard for a lot of Jamaican artists to really take the music far. Because I see, I see artists doing tours in the U.S. where they're doing 15 to 20,000 people at just their show, their headlining. It's not like a mm -hmm. festival. You know, and that's, and I see the Marley brothers targeting that. I see Steve Marley, I see Zilla targeting that and, 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 and going after penetrating that market. And to me, that's a, it's a very noble thing for the entire industry. You know, because they don't really have to do that. You know, you know what I mean? Them, them name or them name, them music, them, them have catalog. It's like, but, but to really take on the grind of the road, and do it on the level. So that, that's kind of where I, I, I'm getting a lot of inspiration from the Mali family right now. Seeing how them, seeing how them, them empire and them enterprise is structured. You know, you have mm -hmm. the cafe, you have the Rowan of him beach house, you have, you know, tough gang, you have ghetto mm -hmm. youth. The cruise. You have the, the cruise. You know, mm -hmm. so, so many, many breaking mm -hmm. things. You know, and I'm sure there's a lot of things in store. And the and movie, it's like, the Bob Marley One Love movie. movie. Have you seen on, it? You know? <laughs> no, I've definitely seen it. You know what I mean? And it's such mm -hmm. a great thing for Jamaica. It's such a great thing for reggae music. It's such a great thing to see the different sides of, of Bob himself. And, you know, and yeah, mm -hmm. it's just a great thing. And I love the Rastafari representation in the music. As Absolutely. Well. Love it. Love it. No, no, sure. no, Kabaka, I couldn't have you here and not ask you, um, you know, you know, these questions. Oftentimes, you know, you, you naysayers, whether it's on X or just social media in general, you know, there is just this conversation to say, you know, when, when, whenever you should speak out about issues, whether issues affecting the music, the government, the country, um, people always tend to say you are selective in the things that you choose to speak about. Um, what, what what do you say to persons who are of that impression, thinking that, you know, you're not talk about the things them? Yeah, I think <laughs> I think people take certain things for granted, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's like, just imagine if you if you show up to work every day and just start talking about every single thing where bother you. You know, and y'all are said in the presence of 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 your boss, them or whoever it is, and that are gonna create a problem. Eventually, them are gonna cut you. It's like, and and that's and that's the reality. Like, I don't think people people like really putting things in perspective. Like we've seen over the years the damage to the music industry based on ones just openly expressing everything where them have an issue with. You know, and it's not that I don't have an issue with certain things. Of course, I have an issue with certain things. Mm -hmm. But I have to be smart about what may I do. Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the day, may I have people for feed. I may have, may have a wide team that depend on me. 
If me just start open my mouth about every single problem, what have happened to Kabak? And then what have happened to one of the, the man them out there where securing this reggae industry so that other artists can go on and continue the, 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 the legacy and the tradition? It's like if, if you pre even His Majesty, His Majesty chose his words wisely. Mm -hmm. He never just speak about every single little thing where I go on. And it's like, people, you know, people might see that and say, oh, Kabaka, Ray, and, and people, people define Rasta by a certain era of the militant era of Rastafari and the, 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 the era where, you know, the bonfire era, which mm -hmm. is an era where me growing up, and I, I've, I've been very much influenced by that. And if it was up to me alone and thing, you may have probably be that same thing and just a bonfire upon everything when me I see. But mm -hmm. we see the re we see the results of it. We see where so many artists couldn't go up on tour, and then these these artists and these bands from other countries end up taking over the industry. And now we are subjugated to some of them in within the industry, you know. And we don't have our biggest artists doing the biggest shows internationally. And that's just a reality. And a lot of that come down to certain things that were said and the restrictions that were imposed upon artists. So we, as the ones them know, we're learning from, from other people, not necessarily mistakes. Because I'm not wrong, you know, mm -hmm. I'm free to say whatever I want to say. You know? mm -hmm. But you have to acknowledge that there's repercussions for certain things. You know what I mean? So I will always choose to speak on the thing that will matter to me and feel like it will have the most effect. So when I talk about trample them and I talk about child molestation, child molestation addresses a root cause issue, you know, where a lot of the trauma that results from that, that end up resulting in other issues where you are sick. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you don't stop the trauma where children go through, them now go resort to them. They, if you stop it, them now go resort to certain things. You understand and certain expressions because them don't have that that the kind of mental block. You know, so when I speak about things, I speak about the root cause of the issue them and things where you understand, like, you know, people upset about the whole thing where they and you know, me, me met the tweet after I saw Valiant's video. And it's like, you know, nobody never ever really come to me and ask me for speak on what was my opinion in. And that was the thing, you know, and all of these places, them run with articles and them say, about oh, Kabaka burn out the artists and, and Kabaka mm -hmm. talk about this and him not. My thing, my issue with that, you know, was, you know, Valiant can do it. He's a young artist. He might go do what he wanted to create excitement. But to me, when I look through the comments and the video, it's like, man, I said, nobody in Jamaica don't see this as offensive to Rasta. You know, and that was my thing. Like, to me, it's really the population, me, I say, that's interesting. You know, no reaction to this. You know, mm -hmm. the, artist, the artist can do what he want to do. Him, you know, him free for do what he want to do. And he's a talented youth, super talented. And him, he even came on a, a sign on an interview, because they interview him. They never interview me, they interviewed him. And he said, yeah, he know that it would have caused a little... Promotion. Mm, controversy, yeah. Yeah, a little controversy. Artists do that, they know. But my mm -hmm. thing is, me is a Rasta you. You know, me, I me, me not eat meat for 22 years. You know, I grow my locks. Me, I get turned on from job interview because of my precept and my beard. Me fight the fight with this thing. You understand? So when, you know, if, if somebody come out and say, you know, man, I live like Muslim and I wear the hijab and I do all kind of things and I the whole Muslim community would have come mm -hmm. down and They'd find it offensive. Mm -hmm. You know, but Kabaka Pyramid alone find this thing offensive. I found that interesting. You know what I mean? But, you know, it's like, as I said, Valiant, a good artist. You know, him, him sing some songs that I don't approve of and certain topics and certain things. It's a good artist. You know what I mean? I don't have a problem with him per se. It's more, where are we as a people? Do we really respect Rastafari? Right? Rastafari, that is a part of the identity of Jamaica. Like, do we really respect that? And don't come talk to Kabaka Pyramid about artists who have locks, but they are not Rasta. And say about I should be talking about them because no, artists who is not Rasta, that now have nothing to do with me. You understand? 
So mm-hmm. that, 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 that are really my views about the whole thing. But, you know, I was a little disappointed with all that thing that it turned out. Did you play out, yeah. I can't imagine. And, you know, time is chipping away. And I have two final questions because I can't make a leave without asking you these questions. Family life, um, talk to us. What is your balance with the family and music? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think family life is important. You know, I, I, I always try for when I'm not on tour, you know, I try to spend as much time with my family as possible. That's so why I'm back and forth to Florida, Jamaica. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And yeah, it's important to me, you know, to, to, to be that kind of grounding force within the family to one and, and keep the connections with everybody. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And and yeah, your response, so <laughs> your response is so vague. Are you a dad? Your response is so vague. Are you a daddy? And what is no, the no, most? No, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Not yet. Okay. Okay. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. You know? <laughs> okay. Okay. Because <laughs> I know you know you just skirt around. No, but you are like, Yeah, but, I know, did. I did. That, I just. Yeah, I understand. So we still. And, Kind of, I look for the right one for kind of set the phone. Yes, and, with that. and that's very, that's very, very important because you know it doesn't make any sense. You just get somebody and start a family, and yeah. you know a couple months down that's the line, right. you, you're having regrets. Yeah, I've seen where I've seen where families, you know, split apart because there's imbalance. So for me, mm-hmm. it has to be the right balance, and I think that's one of the reasons why I've been so. You know, not just wild and, and loose when it comes to certain things. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like there's a discipline there where I know say, if it if it's going to be a stressful situation, I'd rather avoid it. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And and not just stressful on me, but you know why you, you grow up in an environment where there's consistent arguments and, and all of them kind of it's things. Hostile. So it's very important mm-hmm. for me to establish the right foundation. You and know. it's not being too picky for people who I think say might be too picky. <laughs> you have to really make yeah, sure no, it's just, right. Just never, just not lucky like that so far still. But, you know, we're just mm-hmm. patient, patient. And finally, a, a quote from Kabaka. At the youth, them time now. We have to give them little guidance and energy. And this was a quote that you made um on one of your social media posts. Now, what's your advice to the next generation of dancehall and reggae entertainers who are listening right now? I would say, you know, to take responsibility for what you do. And, and you know, it's very important that we, if, if we're conscious of who we are, you know, to understand that we have influence and know that how are we using our influence? Are, are we using it for positive or is it for negative? You know, and that's the thing. There are, you know, around us that we can't see, there's angelic forces, there's demonic forces out there. And that's just the reality. And depending on what you are doing, you can get the assistance from angelic forces or demonic forces. If, if, the, if the demon them see, say you are doing a certain thing where can help them, they are going to give you energy. And you can achieve great success with that. But to me, I would have rather attract the angelic forces you know, the godly forces towards what I'm doing and give me energy to effect positive within the world and within the wider universe. Because at the end of the day, we are soul beings. We're not just physical beings. And everything we do, it has an impact within the spiritual world as well, even though we can't see it and we don't necessarily see the effects. So what goes around comes around. You know, everything is karma. So we can live for today and just do, you know, whatever it is for make money and for get hype and get attention, but it will all circle back around. You know, it will all circle forward. So, you know, it's, it's good to be mindful of these things. And I just want the youth them know that, you know, we have that responsibility as leaders and as, as artists, because artists is that central force where, you know, is it's an artist changed my life, you know, and that's the type of influence we do have and it's real. Wow. Kabaka Permit, thank you so much. We definitely have to do a part two. I knew from the get-go that your story could not be told in one hour. So we we, we, we hope you're open to a part two. But we are truly grateful for this conversation. And can I tell you something? The messages are coming in for you.